All right. Yeah. So I'm very excited to be doing this, and um, as as John mentioned, I have a I have I have a farm. I have kids, and so getting to conferences is kind of a pain in the butt. And so I just thought this was such a good idea uh, as a way to help disseminate information and you know keep things easy and um, cheap and perhaps a little bit more relaxed. So um, so I just want to briefly introduce my lab and kind of tell you where we're coming from and the types of questions that we're interested in. Um, and I think that I, sometimes I get the sense that people say, oh, those people, they do microbiome research. We're sick of hearing about human microbiome research. And we try to take it from a different approach in that um, we see it from, from in terms of microbial ecology. And so a lot of the things I think I'm going to be talking about, you might be doing in marine or soil or any other ecosystem. Um, and so this, here's a picture of my lab, um, and, and these are the people that have done most of the work. Um, not sure if you can see my cursor, but uh, I'm on the far left, and, and just to my side is Amanda Elmore, um, graduate student, and in front of her is Alex Schubert. Uh, going to the right, Joe Zackler is a graduate student who finished in the spring and is now working with Eric Scar. Um, a lot of the samples that I'm going to be talking about today came from projects that um, Alex and Joe worked on. Uh, Hamida Sinani uh, was a technician in the lab who did pretty much all the DNA extractions for these. Tao Ding is a former postdoc. Um, going to the right, Catherine Iverson is our bioinformagician. Uh, behind Catherine is a, a former rotator in the lab who we give lots of crap because he didn't actually join the lab. Um, but he's the guy that kind of got this project going and um, as a rotation project of all things. And to his right is Matt Jenner and, and then uh, Neil Baxter. And, um, Matt's also done a lot of work on this and kind of, you know, you, projects work through stages where you, you get some cool results, which is what JT did, and then Matt came along and um, has done a lot of, of or a few follow-up experiments to um, look at things. Um, and so what are we interested in understanding? So we're interested in understanding the forces that shape microbial communities. And like I said, I think this is a pretty universal question that most microbial ecologists have. And then we're also interested in why that variation matters. Um, you know, you can, you can go out to a field and sample soil, and you could go to two different fields or two different plots within a mile of each other, and they could be totally different uh, in terms of their microbial ecology. Uh, and the same is true for humans, that, you know, you could, you know, people on this, on this seminar, uh, we all have very different microbiota, um, but, but do we care? Uh, does that matter? Is variation bad? Is different bad? Um, and so one of the things that motivates me is uh, shown in this picture. And so here's a pasture behind my house where we've got a ewe nursing two newborn lambs, uh, her twins. I have my wife and my daughter who's, I think, about two in this picture. And so you can imagine that those lambs are getting inoculated with their first gulp of microbiota from their mom um, in just the same way that Ruth received uh, probably much of her initial microbiota from my wife, Sarah. And so you can imagine that, you know, in agriculture, um, you know, how these lambs thrive uh, is very dependent on these first moments of them getting colostrum and getting their microbes. Uh, the grass around them is dependent on the microbes to fix nitrogen, to put it into clover and alfalfa so they can eat. And, I mean, obviously Ruth is dependent on Sarah, um, or was dependent on Sarah for uh, her microbiota, and then the broader family. And in a, in a bigger context, you could say, well, you know, my kid's going to grow up to be better than your kid. Uh, not really, but <laughs> uh, in terms of her microbiota, because she's exposed to all this, right, and that she's getting so many more um, inoculations, so much um, more uh, microbes coming into her, um, that, the, that there's an idea of the hygiene hypothesis that if, you know, if kids are exposed to lots of different antigens, then they don't tend to develop asthma as much. So, again, just file this picture away, and, and you can perhaps go through your own day and your own life and think about how you're interacting with the microbiota around you and how that might be affecting your health, right? So, so some of the questions that we have that you probably do too include, you know, why do we see the diversity that we do within our communities? Why are instances of these communities so different? You know, the idea that, you know, me and anybody else on this call have such different communities. And what if we could take community X from environment A and put it in environment B? So I think it's Mary Firestone 
uh, out in California that, that does this, where she takes pots of soil and, and moves them around to see how that affects the soil biodiversity. What if we could take community X and start it over in environment A? Okay, so, you know, this is kind of a lot of the stuff that, like, Rich Lenski does with E. coli, where he can have, you know, he's got a freezer full of E. coli going for thousands of, tens of thousands of generations, and he can go back and start it over. So what if we could do that with microbial communities as well? Wouldn't that be pretty cool? And then once, once you know, a community is assembling, can we change its direction to make it look more like community Y? And you might think of this in terms of things like landscape restoration or, um, you know, other environments. And we do this in the gut, okay? And so that's, again, it's just another environment. And um, the one of the reasons that I've shifted from doing things in soil when I was a postdoc in Joe Handelsman, Joe Handelsman's lab to doing it in the gut is that it, it's a con it's a tractable microbial community. Uh, when I was a postdoc, I was really proud that I'd sample the grand total of a thousand sequences from a half gram sample of soil. Uh, I went home and told my father-in-law, who is a farmer in Missouri, he said, well, that's, that's, that's great, Pat. I've got, you know, 500 acres. What does your half gram sample tell me about my 500 acres? Um, and in, at least in terms of, you know, thinking about the human gut or mice or, or other host systems, you know, the, the community is somewhat bounded. Um, it's not so expansive as acres of fields. Uh, the non-human systems are fairly reproducible, and we'll talk about that as I go through the talk. It's pretty easy to perturb. Um, so we can give antibiotics, we can change diet. Um, I found this was kind of hard to do in, say, soil or aquatic systems because just the act of kind of putting in the perturbation, kind of putting in acetate or putting in a carbon source, uh, you know, put the shovel in the soil, you're going you're gonna to be disturbing the community. We have lots of phenotypes to look at, There's, and, and we think of these as disease models, right? Um, and so in my lab, we're interested in things like Clostridium difficile and colon cancer. We can also then generate different environments through the genetics of our hosts. Um, and, and then we can also generate communities um, using uh, germ-free animals, and, and that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today. And so um, it's not for everybody, but we find that you know, in terms of thinking about microbial ecology, these host-associated communities are really powerful for, for thinking about uh, microbial ecology. And so why do we observe the, the diversity we do in the gut? Um, there's lots of reasons that people give. One would be genetics and evolution, that uh, we've co-evolved with our microbiota, and that perhaps explains um, why we have the community that we do. Um, we also know that you're more similar to your, your family in terms of your microbiota than you are to um, someone that's not related to you. Uh, we think diet is also important. You know, if you're eating a vegan diet versus uh, you know, Big Mac diet, uh, we anticipate that you're going to have a different community structure. Uh, environmental exposure, as I mentioned with you know, the picture of Ruth, um, you can imagine that living in a rural community may alter your microbiota versus living in, say, downtown New York City. I should also add that a lot of these are hypotheses at this point. Um, they sound like plausible stories, but for a lot of these, we don't really have solid evidence to support things one way or another. Life history events, like whether you were breastfed or bottle fed, you know, whether you took tons of antibiotics as a kid, uh, your immune system. Um, again, just because two individuals are twins doesn't mean they have the same microbiota because their immune systems might be considerably different in terms of what they've been exposed to over their life. And of course, it's very difficult to separate these forces to determine, to determine their relative importance. And so, you know, one of the things that I think surprises a lot of my clinical colleagues is that ecologists have been thinking about this for a long time and have been having knockdown, drag out fights over why do we see the biodiversity we see. And so, uh, Havel proposed the idea of the neutral theory that the differences we see, um, the, the differences between trophically similar organisms are not important. And basically what we see around us is the product of each species taking a random walk. And so an example of this is island biogeography. Um, this then is uh, countered by the idea of that there are community assembly rules, that there are rules. And this was proposed by Diamond in the 70s, I believe, where he, he posited that competition is the primary force that shapes the structure of communities and that populations will seek to minimize their niche overlap. And so kind of the story of forest succession that we all learned in elementary school, that certain things have to happen before other things can happen. Um, and that there is 
competition and that um, you know, things like you know your, your like your life history characteristics do matter. And if you're familiar with uh, molecular evolution, you're perhaps familiar with the idea of neutral and selection-based models of of evolution. And I, I like to think of it, this as being analogous. And at least in that case, we know that the truth is somewhere in the middle, and that it's not either or, but it's probably both. Um, and trying to figure out where we are on one end of the continuum um, is more helpful than kind of staking a you know a claim on um, one one theory being correct. So I'm going to shift now and talk about some of the experimental systems that we have for studying the formation of host-associated communities. And so, you know, we can go straight to humans and look at the neonate gut. And so this is a paper that came out of David Relman's lab uh, in 2007 by Palmer, where they looked at 14 uh, newborns over the course of the first 200 days of life. Um, and so you can see these 14 kids are totally different. Um, and that, I think, is just totally awesome. Uh, and it's also just maddening because, I mean, there's no, I mean, is there replication here? <laughs> um, that there's just so much variation um, is kind of the question that we're interested in. Um, but again, it's, it's hard to do this experiment. You can't take the kid, you know, you can't take kid seven and go back to day one and start over again. Um, and, and we can't control for things. Obviously, we don't want to be doing anything unethical. So uh, we're a bit limited, but at the same time, it's good to know what community assembly looks like in humans. Um, Ruth Lay uh, had a paper a few years ago published in PNAS where they took an infant uh, from birth through the first three years of life, and I've taken their data and reanalyzed it. Um, they only showed one axis of a PCOA. I am showing two here. And when you show two, that you, you can really see three different community states. And so the gray points are where the kid starts out. Uh, the, the red square is, is the mom. And you can see that depending on different life history changes, the kid's community changes. And when I look at this, you know, I always get parental angst and thinking about all the bad things we do to our kids um, and whether or not, you know, did we give solids to our kid too early? Should we have given the antibiotics? Um, and so you can imagine taking this kid and saying, well, what would have happened if, you know, they hadn't have gone on the Seftin or an adult a diet um, and, and they were just allowed to go straight to an adult diet without the antibiotic? Would they have wound up over at these blue points or would they have gone on a trajectory further out on the red points? Um, so in my lab, we've also looked at po wild populations of rodents um, where they have a overlap in geographical space up in northern Michigan. Um, and, and these are two species of paramiscus, uh, the, uh, you might think of them as field mice. Um, and, and so we had about 50 uh, leucopus and 50 maniculatus, and we did about I don't know, a million different things, and we're unable to find any difference between these mice, um, which is pretty amazing that uh, we have such a negative result. Uh, and so um, we looked at things like their, you know, um, mice. So we did a um, capture and tag and release. So we were able to capture the same mice multiple times um, in, in these live traps, and, and we couldn't attribute anything to mice, you know, captured from the same trap. The physiological state, uh, nothing allowed us to really distinguish between these populations of mice. There's just tons of variation, very complex. Um, and so just to kind of add to that, you can see this, this 3D ordination um, where um, I forget which is which. It doesn't really matter because the, the blue and red points are the two different species. And they really overlap, um, making it pretty difficult to see any kind of difference uh, in these two species of mice. So Jeff Gordon's group has done what I consider kind of crazy transplants, where they take uh, zebrafish gut contents and put them into germ-free mice, and then mice gut contents and put them into germ-free zebrafish. Um, and here the, the host, it appears that the host manipulates the community to look more like itself. And I haven't had a chance to, to look at it yet, but this week in Cell they had a paper that I understand they took soil and put it into a mouse and then a termite into a mouse as well as zebrafish into mice. And so, um, you know, to some extent, some of these experiments, they're interesting, but 
uh, it's, they're, they're pretty extreme, right? Um, so we had a paper that we published in PNAS last year where, where we, we went mouse into mouse in a collaboration with Gary Huffnagel's lab. They took sequel contents and gavaged that into germ-free mice. And so the red dot is where these mice started. So these are four co-housed mice. Um, I'm sorry, five co-housed mice. And, and you can see that initially they're very different from each other. And um, you can see as they go through the first you know, 21 days of life, they wind up at these, these squares on, on the left side where the communities have coalesced to look more similar to each other. And the day-to-day -day shifts are less drastic. Um, and again, this, this is another plot from that paper showing that uh, in the top plot, the average distance to the previous day, that pretty quickly the, the, there is still movement in the community structure, but it slows down. And then if you look from mouse to mouse at the same day, um, initially there are wide differences, but again, pretty quickly uh, the community stabilizes both within each individual and within the cage. So an important thing to know about mice uh, is that mice are coprophagic, and so they eat feces. And this is thought to be a mechanism by which, at least within a cage, they could be sharing their microbiota. So a, down, a, a limitation of this study is that we had one cage of germ-free mice, and so it'd be interesting to know whether or not we repeated this in another cage, we would have gotten the same result. So Jeff Gordon's group um, has also popularized the idea of humanizing mice, where you can, you can take human feces and use that to colonize germ-free mice. And if you, if you read this quote from Pete Turnbow's paper in 2009, and, and they've had several papers come out after it doing similar techniques, they, they talk about membership overlap, that they see you know, all the bacterial phyla, 11 of the 12 bacterial classes, 58 of 66 genus-level taxa detected in the donor. But you'll notice something missing from that, and that's do they come back in the same composition, the same structure, the same abundances? And I guess what I'm going to be showing you is that they don't, um, that the community structures that we see um, once you've colonized mice with human feces looks quite a bit different than their original donor. And I think we can all agree that that, that should make a lot of sense because you're taking a microbial community from stool, which is in the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract, which is very anaerobic, and you're putting it in the mouth, and it has to get through the stomach, which is pretty acidic, has to get through uh, the ileum, which um, is more liquidy, uh, and then get to the colon, and it's got to do things like, you know, colonize the mucosal layers. It's got to, um, you know, colonize the gut again. Um, the other thing is that, you know, the, the idea is out there also, as I mentioned earlier, that we've co-evolved with our microbiota. So why would a mouse take a human community to get it to look like a human, right? It should make it look like a mouse. Um, at least that's the hypothesis. And so intriguing insights from this discussion include that humans are a pain. I'm not just talking about your in-laws, but uh, as in terms of experimental subjects. They're just so variable. There's so many variables that you'd have to consider. It's difficult to differentiate between the microbiota of animals living in a similar environment and consuming a similar diet as we saw with the Paramiscus study, should also add that that is not a novel result. Um, Howard Ackman has seen similar things with primates in Africa, um, and other, other studies have, have found similar results as well of sympatric populations living together. Um, we see a similarity of community structure between co-housed germ-free mice colonized with um, murine sequel contents. Um, and then we also see the ability to colonize germ-free mice with diverse microbiota. Uh, and that this could be an attractive model for studying community assembly. That, um, you know, we, we can't sample pups uh, because they're so small. Uh, we've tried this where we kind of get them before weaning, and I mean, they just don't poop very much, and it's hard to get enough biomass to do anything with. Um, and if you take them away from their mom, they get cold and die, and it's just not a good thing. Um, and so the germ-free model is, is pretty attractive because it's a, you know, it's a, it's a vacuum, and nature abhors a vacuum. So you put something in there, it's going to colonize. So I want to tell you now about experiments that we've been doing uh, studying community assembly in these germ-free mice. And um, these are data that um, I, I've been <laughs> rushing the last week or two to process and analyze to share with you guys. 
um, our MySeq hit the fritz this past month and uh, we've been a little bit behind. So um, the, the various questions that we had uh, include these as well as a number of others, but uh, these are the ones I'm going to talk to you about today, which is how well do germ-free mice resemble their human donors? Uh, does intra-individual variation stabilize with time? Uh, does variation within a cage stable with, stabilize with time? And, and do we see a, a loss of variation? How reproducible is community assembly across cages when you, you gavage mice with the same donor community? And then how important is host genetics in shaping community structure? And then finally, just you know, thinking about this idea of uh, moving a community to look more murine or to look more human, are the quote-unquote climax communities, the final communities once the communities have stabilized, more similar to each other than the donors were to each other? And I'll just point this, put this out there that um, you know, we can do hypothesis-driven microbial ecology research where we have actual questions a priori, and that's, that's really what we've been trying to do here. So our strategy was to colonize germ-free mice with the feces from 11 human donors. We had about three to five mice per cage and about one to four cages per donor. And we took stool samples from these mice over the course of 20 days. And then we sequenced the V4 region of the 16S gene on a MySeq using a protocol we published last year that gives us an error rate around 0.01%. And then we use this random program called Mother to analyze the data. So here's a, um, a bar chart of the different bacterial uh, phyla that we find in these 11 uh, stool samples. And so it's not surprising that we see tons of bacteroidetes and firmicutes. These are anaerobes that predominate uh, gastrointestinal tract. We also selected some uh, donors that were high in proteobacteria as well as um, some that are higher in actinobacteria and one that was high in fusobacteria. Um, and again, with the goal of getting different types of communities to go into these mice. So if you make an ordination, If you make an ordination of these uh, donor communities, you see quite a bit of variation in their community structure, which again was what we were going for, trying to pick communities that looked quite a bit different from each other. So the first question we had was, how well do germ-free mice resemble their human donors? And it appears not very well. So uh, we're looking at a, a metric that we, that's called theta YC, which takes into account the membership and abundance of the um, OTUs in a community. This does a pretty good job of uh, sampling and weighting the entire distribution of the community. Um, and you can see that the 11 donors across the bottom and each dot representing a different mouse at about 20 days, <coughs> we see um, varying levels of success. But in general, the communities don't look very much like uh, the human donors. Um, and so that's intriguing um, and perhaps a little bit frustrating because you might want them to you might expect them to look a little bit more like humans um, but it's also kind of cool because it says yeah the mice are selecting for something totally different uh, than the humans are so for the bulk of the rest of the talk I'm going to focus on the samples uh, the mice to the far right side in this uh, donor H3293 um, and so what I did was I, I took um, this individual's uh, 14, or I guess we had 16 stool sample, 16 mice that we colonized with this donor, um, four mice in four different cages. Um, and what you see here is intra-individual variation, where we look at the distance to the previous day. So how similar is the mouse to on day five to day four, or day 15 to day 14? And what you see is like we saw in that PNAS paper that initially there's a lot of variation, uh, that there's a lot of changes going on in getting the community to um, settle down and stabilize. And of course, the communities continue to change, but the day-to-day -day variation um, is less than it was in the first couple of days of colonization. Um, and this is a general phenomenon that we see, um, again, regardless of the donor community. 
Another question then is, does individual variation within a cage stabilize with time? And so if we, if we take the four cages of this, of this donor sample and we look at the re root mean square distance to all the other mice in the cage on any given day, what does the community structure look like? <coughs> and so we already saw that the um, mice day to day on an individual level uh, get more stable with time. And what we see here is that the variation between animals in the same cage also reduces with time. And so, um, in a way, this is saying that if you put something into a mouse, into a set of mice, they will all come out looking similar, okay? And that they will follow the same trajectory. And that's, um, what's interesting, again, is that we see this over different cages. But again, because mice are coprophagic, they could be just cross-feeding each other, and that's having a normalizing effect on their community structure. So the next thing I asked was, how reproducible is the community assembly across cages when we use the same donor? So we had four cages that all received the same donor community. And each line here represents the root mean squared distance to the mice in the other cages. And so what you can see is that, in general, the, the communities look pretty similar to each other. There is still a, a, a small amount or decent amount of variation between cages, but they're perhaps more similar to each other than they're not. And if you compare them to the variation we saw um, within a cage or within an individual, um, they, they, they look, you know, pretty similar to each other. And so again, that's pretty intriguing because, um, again, we're taking the same stool sample going into um, germ-free mice that are reared in different cages. Um, Actually, this experiment was done twice, so with two cages each time, um, about two years apart from each other. And so uh, that we see this level of similarity, even though yeah, there's a time difference, there's cage differences, um, I think is, is pretty remarkable. And, and to me, at least, suggests that there's you know, more, perhaps, deterministic rule-based forces going on than just random noise. So the next question we had was, how important is host genetics in shaping the community structure? And the experiments that we've been doing and I've been talking to you about are using the mouse on the left. It's a strain called C57 Black 6. It's a highly inbred line. So basically every allele is homozygous. Um, it's got a pretty strong Th1 immune response. The mouse on the right is a Swiss Webster, which is an outbred mouse. So it's uh, much more genetically uh, varied <coughs> um, and, and would be expected to have a much more variable, much higher variable uh, immune response as well as just, you know, very different genetics. And so the question was, if we took germ-free black six and germ-free Swiss Webster mice and colonized them with the same stool sample, what would the communities look like um, once they assembled? Um, and then how, how would they assemble in, in kind of the same way? And basically what we saw was that, yeah, um, they do assemble in the same way and that they do tend to look pretty similar to each other. Of course, this is, you know, two genotypes. Um, and so it's possible that there are other genotypes out there that would definitely select for different microbiota. But it's at least, you know, pretty cool to see that if you take the common community, put it into numerous mice, numerous cages um, in these two different strains of mice that we get um, a convergence of their community structures, which again kind of echoes what we saw in the wild mouse study um, where we couldn't differentiate the two species of mice. Um, you know, in that case, those species of mice were maybe 500,000 year, 500, years apart. Here, these mice, you know, are, are perhaps 100 years apart or, um, it gets kind of fuzzy there how far apart they are, but, you know, the differences aren't big enough to drive a change in the microbiota. Uh, and that's, I think, a, a pretty, pretty fascinating result. Um, part of the sequencer going down meant that I wasn't able to show you data for um, the same experiment but using an additional donor sample. So um, I'll have to fill you in on that story later. So as I indicated earlier, one of the questions we also had was whether the climax communities, or the community at, say, 20 days, 
were more similar to each other than the donors were to each other. And what we actually found was that they're more different uh, from each other than the, than the initial communities were to each other. Um, not really sure what to make of that. Um, this is significant when we do a Kruskal Wallace test comparing um, the, uh, the distances, the median distance from one community uh, to, to, to all the others. Um, but again, it's, it's interesting to see that the, you know, the, the human community really is not adapted to the murine gut environment. And so then the question of, you know, do, how do the communities change over time? Everything I've been showing you thus far has been based on beta diversity metrics and looking at community structure. But how do the communities change with time? And at least in, in this mouse with this, um, in this set of mice with this donor sample, um, we, we see, you know, a lot of populations here. And I'm just showing you four of the most abundant populations that we see. The blue line is a Porphyrmonodaceae. Um, that initially was very abundant and then just crashes out, um, whereas there's an acromantia um, that blooms and stays kind of high uh, throughout uh, the, the experiment. And, and that's interesting because acromantia are known to like to degrade mucus. Uh, and there's a lot of mucus in the, in the epithelial layer of the intestinal tract. Um, it's a member of the Rucro microbia, and we generally don't see it dominating microbial communities. Um, and so there's other things like Paraprevotella, which is a bacteroidete. Uh, so is the Porphyrmonodaceae, and uh, the Blaudia, I think, is a uh, Firmicutes. Um, and so again, we can see these changes in communities, and going forward, we're going to be looking at taking a closer look at these other um, donor samples and the time courses that they had um, in these colonization experiments. So to kind of recap the questions that we posed, um, how well do the germ-free mice resemble their human donors? And it turns out not so much. Um, that, again, if you think about it from an ecological context, there's a lot that would have to go right for a human stool sample colonized into a germ-free mouse to come out looking like a human stool sample. Does intra-individual variation stabilize with time? Yes, it does. That we see in these day-to-day um, distance metrics that we see um, kind of a plateau at a very low level of the day-to-day -day distances for individual mice. Um, and then we also see the same type of plateauing or drop in variation when we look among different individuals within a cage. Um, and this also then stabilizes with time. If we look across cages but using the same donor, um, we see that it's actually pretty reproducible. That that cage to cage variation is is actually relatively small, um, or at least comparable to what we see for intra individual and inter individual variation. And at least in this case, uh, host genetics does not seem to be that important in shaping microbial community structure. Um, there's certainly models out there, uh, genetic models where genes are getting knocked out. Um, where you would expect to see pretty big effects of genetics. But at least in this case, using these two uh, lines of mice, we don't, we don't see much of a difference. And actually, we do see um, larger variation among the climax communities than uh, to the donor communities, which is an interesting result. So going forward, um, as I mentioned, the, these data are hot off the sequencer. Um, We've, like I said, we've, meant, we've replicated this comparison of the Black Six and Swiss Webster mice with an additional stool sample, and that's going on the sequencer, I think, as we speak. One of the things we really want to do is to look closer at the successional patterns for each donor and see if there are commonalities either in taxonomy or in function. One of the things that we saw in the um, mouse study uh, that we published in PNAS where we garvaged in a murine community was an initial bloom of proteobacteria and Veruca microbia that then drops off and gets replaced by Bacteroides and Firmicutes. Um, that's also kind of a common phenotype that we see with mice or humans recovering from antibiotic perturbations. And so it'd be interesting to know whether or not that's being driven more by function or by name tag. And if it's driven by function, I think that would be another strong argument to say that you know niche-based processes, competition, are driving uh, community assembly. 
Um, and it would also be interesting to know how different the immune profile is for these various climax communities. And that, um, you know, if you're putting in different microbiota into these germ-free mice, um, you know, is, is their production of cytokines and immune cells uh, comparable across the different donors, or are they considerably different? Uh, various immunologists have done the, done the work where they look at um, germ-free mice colonized with a single human sample or a single murine sample and find differences, but it would be interesting to know how much variation is there in that differences, those differences if you're colonizing these mice with um, different microbiota. And so in the last couple slides, I, I want to encourage, I guess myself um, and others, to think different about microbial ecology and the microbiota. And so one of the quotes I just, I really love sharing with people is, is the following. And so this is from an individual that I consider to be the, grand, the grandfather, the father of uh, microbiome research. And he wrote in a paper, um, pretty seminal paper, that it would appear to be pointless and doubtful exercise to examine and disentangle the apparently random appearing bacteria in normal feces and the intestinal tract, a situation that seems controlled by a thousand coincidences. I think, you know, pretty much every grad student or postdoc on this call has probably the, the same feeling about their project. Yet, I have nevertheless devoted myself now for a whole year, oh, if that were how long these projects took, virtually exclusively to this special study. It was with the conviction that the accurate knowledge of these conditions is essential for the understanding of not only the physiology of digestion, but also the pathology and therapy of microbial intestinal diseases. And so think for yourself, you know, think to yourself, who, who would have been so bold to think, you know, to think these great thoughts? And it turns out that that was Theodore Escherich back in 1885. And so if you fast forward now 130 years, what's changed? What, what did doc, you know, Dr. Escherich, German pediatrician, seeing kids coming in with diarrhea, trying to figure out why they had diarrhea. What, what didn't he know that we now know? Okay, so, you know, Origin of Species was just published 20 years before. Um, you know, the field of ecology was just be beginning to coalesce and become a real scientific discipline. Statistics as a discipline wouldn't come around probably for another 40 or 50 years. Um, he didn't know what DNA was <laughs> um, as, as, a, as a marker of microbial community. Uh, he didn't realize that the bug we would name for him, uh, E. coli, is actually in everybody. Um, and if you don't have E. coli, then it's pretty difficult to make uh, vitamin K, which is important for blood clotting. And that that's actually a version of that bug is what was causing diarrhea in these kids. And so, you know, I think, you know, if Dr. Eschrick were to come back and say, hey, how, how are you guys doing on that diarrhea problem or uh, that human microbiome problem? I, I kind of worry that he might be a little bit frustrated that we haven't gotten further with all the great knowledge we have, um, especially with all the great sequencing technology and you know, theory that we have behind us. And not to, not to call anybody out too, too strongly, but if you go back to the, the Palmer paper from Dave Relman's lab, you know, this seems to be a pretty obvious example of community succession, right, and trying to understand the effects of different disturbances. Uh, several of these kids did receive antibiotics and antifungals during the first 200 years of life. Yet, if you read that paper, you will not see the word succession or disturbance. Okay? And not that those words necessarily would make the paper you know, any better than it is. It's a great paper. But I think we have a problem where we're still divorcing theory from actual microbial ecology and actual data. And that that's a problem. And that we're not really going to begin to understand variation and the, the effect of variation on health and disease um, and how to manipulate communities until we begin to think about things in terms of ecology and ecological things. And I would also like to just kind of close with a, a perhaps a bit of a pedantic note about process and how we, we go about doing our research and talking about our research. Uh, so this, this slide presentation was prepared in R using two packages called Knitter and Slidify. Uh, so pretty much all the figures that you see here are compiled into the presentation. Um, and so this is a tool that's available for making research more reproducible. Um, you can download it through our GitHub repository. Um, and when we finally get, get the data and get everything submitted, um, the document um, and the paper 
um, will be fully executable. And so a couple years ago, I sent out a, a joke email on April Fool's Day to the mother listserv saying that we had released a version of Mother that had a function called write.paper. We just give it an SFF file, an impact factor, and out comes your paper for whatever journal would match that impact factor. And somebody was pointing out to me that, that we'd actually did that. And so it, it does become possible to have, in a way, write.paper, um, where you can embed your text and your analysis all together. Um, and, and as a way to motivate that, Think about if a, a first-year grad student was trying to learn how to do microbial ecology analysis, and they downloaded your sequence data from your last paper. So the first question is, would they be able to find the sequence data from your last paper? Um, is that in the short read archive? Where is it? What state is it in? Would they be able to reproduce your results um, using the methods you've described in your paper? You know, I see a lot of uh, papers that say, I used Mother to analyze my data, uh, but that's kind of where it ends. And so using things like Knitter, Solidify, um, IPython notebooks are great tools for improving the reproducibility of our data and our analysis. So it's not to say that if it's not reproducible, it's not right. But if it's not reproducible, then it's pretty difficult to know what's going on. Um, so it's just something, again, pedantic that I'll leave you with to think about um, and, and something that I find to be useful in my own lab that, you know, it's it's frequently said that your best collaborator is going to be you in a month, um, and your second best collaborator is your, your PI. Um, and if you've got analyses strung all over the place in random files or push-button tools, it's pretty difficult to reproduce. So I just encourage people to give this a thought. So finally, just I, I, I mentioned these people at the beginning of the talk just to acknowledge my lab. Uh, Matt Jenner and JT McCrone, I've really done a lot of the work of um, getting these samples together. Uh, this ex the experiments represented over about 80 mice um, that were run through these germ-free um, uh, experiments. Um, and, and many of those experiments started with the work of Alex Schubert and Joe Zakular. Uh, but the sequencing, DNA extraction sequencing was all done all mainly by um, Hamida Sinani, JT McCrone, and Matt Jenner. Um, a lot of support from Catherine Iverson and Sarah Westcott, who are two great bioinformat um, bioinformaticians. I've got the link there for this uh, slide deck if you, if you want to pull it down. Um, and then great collaborators we have at the University of Michigan, including Vince Young and Tom Schmidt. And just to give a, a shout out to the U of M, that we have a host microbiome initiative where the university is really investing a lot of money in uh, microbiome research. And with people like Vince and Tom you can, and myself, you can be assured that we really do take an ecological perspective at things. Um, so um, I'd be happy to take any questions that people might have at this point. And um, I guess maybe I'll turn off the slide sharing so I can figure out how to do that. Thanks, Pat. That was an awesome talk. And at one point, I learned how to do applause on here. And I haven't clicked that right button today. So thank you. I'll give you applause. Um, so, uh, if anyone's in the Hangout and wants to ask a question, please unmute yourself and speak up. Uh, I see some messages coming into the chat. Um, so why don't I start with the chat question first. So there's a question from Daniel Bond's group. If we start with germ-free mice, add human donor bacteria, but don't end up with communities that resemble the donor, what do we call them? Humanized-ish or who-mouse? Yeah. I, so we really wrestled with that because um, so we we published a paper earlier in the summer where we we colonized mice with human feces and then ran them through one of our cancer models and um, they look nothing like the human donors um, and I did not want to use the word humanized mice in the paper because they're definitely not humanized they have the human microbiota but it's not humanized so we said things like you know mice colonized with human microbiota and I don't know, it gets humanized is just easy to say, but I think it does give kind of a misconception that these are mice that look like humans. Well, an alternative hypothesis, if you're into old cartoons, I think that came out of Britain, there's actually a way, if you can figure out an acronym of danger and then just call them danger mouse, that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple other questions came from the internet. Uh, so I think you might have hit this one already, but we have a question from Sherry Simmons, and she asks, why do you think the average distance between cages increases over time? So if you can just, is it the, the, the eating poop, or is it um, another factor? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure why that happens. I think it's, it's a gradual increase, and I'm not sure if it's, 
if it's significant. That's something we need to go back and do is to kind of see, you know, is this change meaningful? Um, but, you know, there might, I mean, there might be some role of drift here that there is kind of, you know, it's, we're not saying it's one way or the other, but a combination of factors. So um, that's, a, that's a great question. That certainly stuck out that we do see kind of a slow rise. Um, the other question from Julia is, she says, nice talk. And in your going forward section, when you talk about successional patterns, how will you look at function? Are you going to do metagenomes or pie crust, or do you have a plan for that? Yeah. Um, so we probably won't do metagenomes, and we'll probably do pie crust, which, I mean, isn't the best way to do it. But I think it at least gives a pretty broad sense of what's there. Um, you know, at a very general level. So one of the one of my harangues about metagenomics is that if you see a bug grow in population, its 4,000 genes are also going to go up. So which of those 4,000 genes is important? And so I think if we can perhaps maybe think about bugs in terms of guilds, kind of generally speaking, you know, what do these bugs do? Um, you know, you know, think about like you know the proteobacteria as perhaps being, um, you know aerobic or that the, the acromantia like to break down mucus and thinking about terms and think about bugs in terms of those types of guilds maybe we'll see something there. But. Yeah and I agree with your sentiment the first time I was at a microbiome talk and they were like look functions not con functions conserve but taxa aren't I left the room because I was so irate. Um, yeah. <laughs> so a question from Daniel Bond's group he says from the room so someone with a beer in their hand asks how do you explain the synchronous changes and variation between cages Example, all cages spiked at day four and day eight. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think, um, I don't know. Um, so I think certainly early where we see kind of the synchronous drop in variation, that that's kind of uh, the, the successional things going on. Um, but I, I don't really have a good explanation for what's going on day four and day eight. I think, you know, if we go back and start to look at who those bugs are and what's going on that you know, maybe we'll see something there. But. Well, and it's a question for me. We had Esther Angert speak about gut symbionts, right? And so I know yeah. hamster, some fish. Are there any symbionts that wouldn't ever be coming out in feces in a, your mouse system? And I guess if you start germ-free, do you ever look to see if anything stays in there and doesn't get passed through? Um, so we certainly have, like, like the, the thing that we don't, advertised too broadly that is that a lot of stuff in stool is dead and so you know if so we like to think that you know if it's in the stool then you know it was, it was recently alive um, because it's coming through at pretty high abundances um, but um, so, so there could be things that are really abundant upstream right so like in the stomach or in the cecum that we just don't see in the gut because by the time it gets there you know four hours later it's been degraded. Um, and so, you know, like, so like E. coli is pretty abundant in the mucosal layer, but it's pretty rare in the actual lumen, the stool that comes out. And so, so and then that might be another reason why, you know, we can't really humanize these mice is that we're missing, you know, the kind of the, the, the founding populations that you need to set up, you know, a human stool community. Cool. Well, and then a very, very um, broad-based question, and I'm not surprised who it came from, but Paul Carini asks, what do you think Escherichia would be doing if he had a lab today? I don't know. He'd probably be culturing. Is that what I'm supposed to say? <laughs> <laughs> Considering you asked it, that might be a good answer. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I, I am really, so I've always been in a ag school for my training and for my first gig at UMass Amherst. Um, and so I, I, you know, I was always kind of afraid of physicians and the people that wander around in white lab coats. And I'm, I really like working with these guys and gals because, I mean, they're so open to everything. And um, you know, I suspect if he's like one of my colleagues, a physician scientist, that yeah, he probably has my seat, <laughs> um, where he's trying to, um, you know, perhaps trying to understand. Well, okay, we figured out that this bug E. coli is causing disease, but I mean, if everybody's got E. coli, then why are these people sick and not everybody? Um, I don't know. All right. Any other questions from inside the Hangout? I do. Hey there. 
So I read Missing Microbes over the summer. And, you know, I mean, it's the Martin Blazer book about kind of looking at the impact of antibiotics on microbial communities. And, you know, I mean, that work is very interesting, but like you said, we're kind of missing some ecological approaches that when you do like a single factor, a study looking at a single factor and its impact on microbial communities in mice that are supposed to represent humans, I mean, you get these results, but they're not satisfying towards answering the question of what really is the impact in real life. Um, so where do you kind of see those types of studies going where we're trying to understand how these factors are impacting human microbial ecosystems? Yeah, I mean, so it's obvious that I hope that humans are not mice and that, you know, mice are a model. Um, but, you know, one of the things you learn pretty quickly in working with mice is that they live in very artificial conditions that the, you know, part of my excitement about how similar these mice are is compared to human data where, you know, we sample an individual every day for a month, right? I mean, instead of being down around like 0.2, you're up at like 0.5 or 0.6. Um, but there's just so much variation in humans. Um, so how do we get at these complex things on like, like are antibiotics responsible for obesity? Um, and I think there's a lot of um, epidemiology that could be done to get at that. Um, one of the things that's really important is setting up some type of longitudinal cohort so we can track people over long periods of time. That it's not enough just to get a single sample. You know, things like American Gut Project are great, but it's a single sna snapshot, right? We don't, we're not, we're not getting people over 10 years. And so if we had kids that we were sampling for the next 20 years, which is a long time, um, then we would begin, I think, to start to see some of those things. Um, and the, the model that I like to think about because I used to work with soil is the idea of the long-term ecological research stations from NSF, where these things have been going for 25, 50 years, um, and we need that for humans, right? So, so we can get at some of these questions, but it's complex. But yeah. Thanks for your question. All right, well, I think that uh, we will thank Pat again for doing this and you mentioned the LTERs right and so Christian DeAngelis had done this last month you can go review her talk on soil oligotrophy and next month we will have uh, Julie talking about coral diseases so we will switch to a different type of microbiome and I'd just like to thank everyone for participating it looks like we had about 30 people total see this in real time and we'll watch the metrics increase as the recording is able to be played and immediately, we just had a departmental seminar on, on Tuesday. We only hit about 22 people. So thank you guys for doing this. We're able to have a great audience. And thank you very much, Pat, for sharing your brand new data with us. My pleasure. My pleasure. All right. Thanks for all the great questions, and thanks for hosting. Great. Great. See you guys.